Okay, hello uh, everybody and welcome you in the uh, uh, International Lipid Summit. This is the first International Lipid Summit of this year. Uh, last year we have uh, three summits and it was uh, really uh, uh, fruitful and successful. And I hope uh, the three waves of uh, this year also will be the same. Um, we have a great faculty with us. Uh, um, uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Noretta from Italy, Department of uh, Pharmacology and biomolecular uh, sciences. Uh, uh, um, we have uh, Andreas uh, uh, Alexandros Tsipilis. He is a professor, uh, editor of uh, Hellenic Journal of Atherosclerosis and member of editorial boards of many journal and uh, an active member of European Atherosclerosis Society. And we have uh, Professor uh, Dirk van Leuniski, uh, Clinical Department of Cardiology, University Clinic of Internal Medicine, Graz. We'll start the uh, first uh, session, uh, and I, uh, I will leave the stage for the um, uh, Professor Nomani, Samah Shaheen, Atif Al Bahari to start the first session. Doctor uh, Samah, Fadal. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ashraf. It's an honor to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, I think it's an interesting uh, uh, yeah, any topics that will be discussed, very interesting topics to be discussed with uh, uh, very uh, precious uh, international figures uh, participating in this uh, webinar. So we hope uh, that we will uh, get uh, many uh, recent uh, and up-to-date information. So uh, without uh, any further delay, I'm just uh, honored to uh, introduce my co-chairman, uh, Professor Mohamed Nomani and Dr. Atif uh, Bahari. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, calling for Professor uh, Giuseppe Daniello Norata, a great friend from University of Milan, Italy, professor uh, uh, from Milan, Italy. He will be uh, talking about uh, targeting, I think, ANGPTL3 in dyslipidemia. Professor Norata. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a privilege and an honor to be here today. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Reda for the nice invitation. I really love to talk with you every year and uh, the entire audience for being here today. So I will mainly discuss with you about this uh, emerging target, in like tree protein and uh, the potential role in this lipidemia. What is angiopoietin like tree? The short name for ANGPTL3. It's a protein which is mainly produced by the liver and is essentially a regulator of the activity of uh, a series of lipases. Angiopoietin like tree is inhibiting the activity of lipoprotein lipase and is also targeting endothelial lipase. So why is this relevant in terms of physiology? Because we know that uh, uh, if uh, we place uh, angiopoietin like tree in the context uh, of human physiology, if the levels uh, of uh, angiopoietin like tree increase, uh, then we have uh, we observe uh, an uh, increase in inhibition of LPL, uh, and this uh, uh, is of course uh, reducing uh, the delay or uh, the clearance uh, of uh, chylomicron remnants. So angiopoietin like tree is affecting the exogenous uh, pathway. But angiopoietin like tree is also affecting the endogenous pathway, which is mainly related to VLDL production and catabolism. And indeed, angiopoietin like tree is increasing triglyceride rich lipoprotein secretion by inhibiting lipoprotein uh, lipase, uh, is uh, increasing atherosclerosis, uh, and is also affecting the deposition of uh, fatty acids in uh, uh, several tissues, including uh, the muscles as well as adipose tissue. And moreover, it looks like it's also decreasing uh, LDL clearance. So looking into all the functions uh, of angiopoietin like tree, you can already understand that this is an interesting target uh, from a pharmacological perspective. And why angiopoietin like tree became so relevant uh, in the context of this lipidemia? Around uh, 10 years ago, uh, there was the first report uh, on New England Journal of Medicine showing that uh, carriers uh, of uh, loss of function mutations uh, of angiopoietin like tree were really presenting very low levels uh, of LDL cholesterol, very low levels uh, of plasma triglycerides, very low levels of uh, HDL cholesterol. So suggesting what? Suggesting that uh, angiopoietin like tree protein uh, 
or subjects with loss of function mutations in angiopoietin like three proteins presented combined hypolipidemia. So at that time, this was one of the first genes that were associated with combined hypolipidemia. And the research moved very quickly, addressing the potential role of angiopoietin like three in cardiovascular physiology and pathology. And what we know now is that uh, uh, patients uh, with uh, angiopoietin like three deficiency are protected against uh, coronary heart disease. When the mouse models lacking uh, angiopoietin like three were generated and tested, uh, they were also protected toward atherosclerosis. And measuring angiopoietin like three plasma levels uh, were shown to be associated, uh, the reduction in angiopoietin like three plasma levels uh, were associated with uh, a relative protection toward the risk of developing myocardial infarction. Very recently, this is a paper that was published uh, 10 days ago on European Health Journal. Uh, we also started understanding uh, that uh, the effect of angiopoietin like three protein is not only related to the activity or to the inhibition of lipoprotein lipase. And keep this in mind because this will be relevant for the data with all the drugs that I'm going to show in a few minutes. Anyhow, if you close your eyes and you think like a pharmacologist, uh, looking into the connection between the loss of function mutation in angiopoietin like three and the protection uh, with respect to cardiovascular disease, you will uh, come back to me saying this is a, an excellent target uh, to control this lipidemia. And indeed, we already have three approaches which are in advanced phase of clinical development that target angiopoietin like three. We have two compounds. One is uh, this uh, uh, LRX is an aso anti and the commercial name or the drug name is going to be Vupanerson which is uh, targeting uh, angiopoietin like three. We have a silencing RNA, RAO, ang ang 3 And we have a, a monoclonal antibody designed against angiopoietin like three, Evinacumab. And uh, I would like to review briefly all these three compounds uh, uh, with respect to the clinical data that are available so far. So first of all, I know that uh, you, later you are going to talk more in details about gene silencing. So I will just touch this aspect very briefly. Uh, you have to consider that the genetic information is floating from DNA to mRNA and then to protein. The idea of using an antisense drug or a silencing RNA is a simple idea. We will uh, find uh, a, a sequence of uh, DNA or RNA that uh, could be complementary to the target mRNA. And if uh, uh, we uh, form this duplex, uh, then we block the translation and we decrease the expression of uh, the protein of the target gene. So with this approach, we have two main compounds uh, in terms of uh, pharmacological uh, clusters, uh, which are antisensoluglunucotide, ASO, and silencing RNA, SIRNA. Uh, they are pretty similar in terms of mechanism of action. The key difference uh, is that the SIRNA compounds uh, should be processed in the cytosol and essentially they will induce RNA cleavage in the cytosol. Vice versa, ASO will enter the nucleus and uh, activate a specific enzyme, which is called RNase H, that will destroy the target mRNA. In both cases, we will reduce mRNA, we will reduce the protein expression. How can we implement this from a clinical perspective? So the first compound that uh, is, uh, I will discuss today is uh, the antisensor dunclonucleotide against angiopoietin like three. The name of the compound is Vupanorsen. And these are the data that have been initially generated. Uh, I will, this data go back to no more than four or five years ago in healthy subjects. And if you administer Vupanorsen, you see a reduction in plasma levels of angiopoietin like three up to 93%. So you really silence the expression of angiopoietin like three in the circulation. And this is resulting in an impressive reduction of plasma triglycerides up to 63%, as well as something that was unexpected, that there was a reduction around 46, up to 46% in plasma total cholesterol levels. 
Of course, these are the data from healthy subjects, phase bound study, and very recently, you can see here the report in the European Heart Journal, the first results on patients with diabetes, hepatic steatosis, and hypertriglyceridemia were published, and the data are not so different. So if you take these subjects and you administer Vuponorsen, you see an overall reduction of total cholesterol, which is around 20%. And uh, most importantly, you see an important or similar reduction uh, in uh, non-HDL cholesterol levels. What is impressive is the reduction in uh, the LDL cholesterol levels, uh, meaning a reduction in triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, which is paralleled by an impressive reduction in APOC3 levels. These are the results from a phase two study. So two different doses and different approaches were tested and all the patients uh, were more or less responding to the drug that was administered. Uh, a point of caution when you are using antisense oligonucleotides is that we are aware of uh, uh, the data from the first drugs, uh, let's consider volanesorsen or even mypomorsen, where some problems with platelet counts were reported in original data it was shown that there was an increase in uh, the incidence of uh, thrombocytopenia in these patients. And uh, uh, what the data are indicating up to now with these uh, new compounds that have been redesigned from a chemical point of view that there is no major impact on platelets counts following the injection of Vupanorsen. Vuponorsen is the first compound. Then we have a second compound, which is also in advanced phase of clinical development, which is the silencing RNA against angiopoietin like tree. And this is developed by another company, which is Haroheads. And then you can uh, guess uh, that the name of the compound is Aero ING3. And here are the data that have been uh, presented last year to the European uh, Society of Cardiology Congress for the first time in uh, healthy subjects, healthy volunteers, uh, two injections uh, at baseline and after four weeks uh, of uh, uh, the silencing RNA is ensuring uh, a reduction by up to 70% of uh, plasma triglyceride levels uh, for up to 16 weeks. So a really, really interesting observation. Again, this reduction up to 70% in plasma triglyceride levels is accompanied by an important reduction in LDL cholesterol levels from 37 to 50%, as well as a relevant reduction in plasma APOB levels, again, 29 to 42%. So confirming that if we target angiopoietin like three, we really impact the entire cascade of uh, uh, cholesterol-rich lipoproteins in plasma. Of course, you are asking me, uh, you show us this second compound, which is intriguing, but do we have data available for uh, these lipidemic patients? Uh, this is a slide that I grabbed from uh, Gerald Watts, uh, and again, are the first data that are reported on FH patients uh, and these lipidemic non-FH patients that have been treated with this silencing RNA. And uh, if you don't see clearly this table, you can focus on these results. Uh, which is the mean uh, difference uh, in terms uh, uh, between the placebo group uh, and the treated group. Uh, and when you administer uh, the silencing RNA directed against uh, angiopoietin like three, in uh, FH patients, uh, you see a reduction in uh, plasma LDL cholesterol levels around 37%. Uh, and a similar, as well as not as potent, reduction is observed also in non FH patients, minus 28%. And similarly, we also appreciated the reduction in plasma triglyceride levels, which were more or less around minus 30%. Let's move to the third compound that uh, I will discuss today, which is a monoclonal antibody and is evinacumab, which is a, a important with evinacumab. This is the, among the three compounds, uh, the one which is most advanced in terms of uh, uh, clinical development. Phase one studies have been published in 2017 and uh, what has been observed is that uh, either IV injection or subcutaneous injection of uh, evinacumab is uh, uh, contributing to decreased plasma LDL cholesterol levels, these are the data, as well as plasma triglyceride levels. 
And a very intriguing observation, which was reported the same here, was this one uh, by Daniel Godet, showing that uh, the uh, administration of evinacumab is also uh, working uh, in patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And considering that these patients uh, uh, present uh, a mutation, uh, an important mutation in the LDL receptor mainly, this is suggesting that uh, evinacumab and in general angiopoietin light 3 inhibition is working independently of the LDL receptor. And I will discuss this at the end of my talk. All the other drugs that we know are used to control this dipedemia are mainly working through increasing the activity of the LDR receptor. And you can see here that homozygous patients that were treated with evinacumab were with different results were responding to the treatment in terms of reduction of LDL cholesterol levels, reduction of triglycerides, reduction of non-HDL cholesterol levels, and reduction of apolipoprotein B. This original finding uh, that was generated in only nine uh, homozygous uh, FH patients, uh, and these are uh, the results uh, stratified uh, also for the other parameters uh, I was mentioning. This original data set the stage for uh, this uh, ELLIPSE study that was published uh, last August in New England Journal of Medicine, where uh, the aim was uh, really to test uh, the efficacy of uh, angiopoietin like 3 inhibition in a larger group of uh, homozygous uh, FH patients. And you can see from these results uh, that uh, the administration of uh, evinacumab is uh, reducing by approximately 50% LDL cholesterol levels in homozygous FH patients bearing or not a null-null or a non-null mutation. Again, this is uh, really an intriguing observation because it's suggesting that uh, the inhibition of angiopoietin like 3 is working independently of a major role for the LDR receptor. With the same mechanism of action, uh, Evinacua was tested in patients uh, with uh, hypertriglyceridemia. And again, it was clear that a single injection of uh, evinacuma was contributing to reduce plasma triglyceride levels. Uh, and this was uh, shown either by subcutaneous or uh, uh, intravenous injection, as you can appreciate here. And uh, most importantly, and this is another paper that uh, uh, was published very recently, Evinacuma was shown to be efficacy, efficient sorry, in patients with refractory hypercholesterolemia. I'm sure you will ask me, what is refractory hypercholesterolemia? This is a nice way that the authors used to uh, cluster those patients that were treated with statins, ezetimibe, PCSK9 inhibitors, all the drugs uh, that uh, we know are normally used uh, for the epidemia that were uh, not responding to these drugs. So they clustered under refractory hypercholesterolemia, patients that uh, were not responding to the available treatment. And what was interesting here was that uh, they all responded to the treatment with evinacumab. So in other words, uh, evinacumab is really working uh, in those patients which are not responsive to other lipid-lowering therapies. This is bringing uh, uh, my presentation to the conclusion. So the key message uh, that I would like to deliver to you today is that the inhibition of angiopoietin like 3 involves a mechanism of action that are different from those of the classical lipid-lowering drugs. So we know that uh, if you think about statins, zetimibe, uh, niacin, PCSK9 inhibitors, they are mainly working through the LDR receptor, through the induction of LDR receptor, and therefore we expect that patients with a defect in LDR receptor will be less responsive. And indeed, this is the case. So if you use uh, an angiopoietin like 3 inhibitors, you really are able to control hyperlipidemia in these patients. And this is mentioned in uh, my, the second line of my conclusion, angiopoietin like 3 inhibition or blockade is independent of the LDR receptor and therefore could be an interesting approach for the treatment of patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia as well, uh, as well as for those patients with hypercholesterolemia that cannot achieve the desired values available or the desired value based on the available therapies. 
of course, where is uh, uh, the research, the clinical research going on? Now there is a lot of interest in testing whether angiopoietin light ray inhibition could be uh, also efficient in patients with refractory hypertriglyceridemia. So whether these patients uh, which uh, either present FCS, uh, familial calomicronemia syndrome, as well as NASH diabetes and adult disorders associated with hypertriglyceridemia that uh, are not responsive to the classical treatment with fibrates, omega-3 or nicin could benefit by the inhibition with angiopoietin electric. And with this, uh, I will conclude my talk uh, and I would like already and again, to really acknowledge uh, Professor Reda for the invitation and the faculty for being here today. Th thank you, I'm Professor Reda. Uh, as usual, uh, fantastic uh, presentation of uh, a difficult uh, subject. You, you make it easy uh, so that uh, one can uh, now be an expert in angioprotein like uh, three inhibitors. However, uh, if, if the panel allow me to start the questions, I'm sure there is a lot of there are a lot of questions about this issue. Uh, but being working mainly on uh, LPL lipoprotein lipase, one could not expect uh, a much uh, a reduction in the LDL cholesterol. Uh, what is the link in this? Yeah, and this is this is a key question and a really intriguing question. Thank you for bringing this this point because. Uh, uh, Initially, angiopoietin light ray inhibition was designed to really target LPL. And then here by year, month by month, we realized that uh, angiopoietin light ray inhibition is also working to other mechanisms. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the observation in homozygous FH was initially unexpected. And then uh, once we saw that there, was an there is an efficacy on this uh, cluster of patients, uh, uh, the working hypothesis is that uh, uh, the inhibition of angiopoietin light ray is really helping in speeding up the entire catabolism of lipoproteins. So not only you inhibit the LDL secretion, but you also speed up uh, LDL particles catabolism. And this is the way that uh, we are using to explain why we see a benefit. The key point is that this benefit is independent on the LDL receptor. Okay, any question from the panel? Professor Ashraf, yes, I have a question. Uh, thanks, Professor Norata, for a very meticulous and sophisticated uh, presentation about a novel um, subject. Uh, actually, I have one comment and two questions. As you know, the idea or the hypothesis of uh, inhibition of uh, angiobutin like 3 is very crucial. Single allele inhibition seems to be beneficial. Double allele inhibition, it, it may be deleterious. So my question for you, uh, what, what uh, the available data about HDL reduction? We have any data about L HDL reduction, which may be harmful. And what's your expectations about the future of this drug? It will be used alone or in combination with the statins or uh, small interfering RNA. And what is the category of patients? Would uh, this... Uh, theory will be preferred in this uh, uh, situation. Okay, I start with the first point uh, uh, about the deleterious effect of uh, uh, an entire uh, loss of function mutations. There are few patients that have been described uh, during uh, a uh, loss of function mutation on both alleles. Uh, they are presenting with uh, LDL cholesterol levels of two, three milligram deciliters, which means nothing. Still, uh, uh, they behave very well uh, and they live longer. This is what is available up to now. Uh, and there, is, there are no problems with uh, uh, brain development or some concerns and that could be associated with the ability of lipoproteins to provide vitamins to the tissues. At least this is what is known. And uh, uh, the phenotype is also associated with very low HDL cholesterol levels. In, indeed, we, we, we talk of angiopoietin like three loss of function as a general hypolipidemia. Of course, your point is very relevant uh, because one aspect is to born with a mutation. So our organism has the chance to adapt uh, to the absence of angiopoietin light tree. Another point is to induce or reduce uh, the amount of angiopoietin light tree pharmacologically. And I do not expect uh, that uh, we will uh, uh, use uh, a uh, amount of drug uh, that will bring LDL cholesterol levels low to 10, 5 milligram deciliters. Uh, but uh, I'm sure the uh, amount of drug concentration will be adjusted to really go below what are the suggestions by the guidelines. And of course, uh, uh, this is a drug that uh, uh, probably will first be used in combination 
to really allow patients uh, that uh, do not reach the target uh, with uh, maximum tolerated doses of statins or the combination with TCSK9 inhibitors. And uh, uh, maybe in few cases, uh, they can be used alone uh, with those with very, uh, very rare genetic diseases. Uh, I'm thinking of some homozygous FH, which will not respond uh, neither to statins nor to PCSK9 inhibitors nor to ezetimab. So it will be dose adjustment or selectivity adjustment for HDL non-reduction? Yeah, I think uh, both at the end. I mean, clinical data are undergoing right now, so we will see how uh, the different uh, uh, approaches uh, will be managed uh, and uh, perhaps we will have different indications according to the type of patients that we could be treated. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Professor Norata, <coughs> I uh, just have a question about the resistant dyslipidemia. Is there is a definite definition for this uh, expression? Yeah, I mean, they, they use the more than resistant, they use the, the word refractory, which anyhow is conveying the same message. So these are patients that are treated with all the available drugs, even in combinations. So if you look into the paper, they, have been, they were treated with statins, maximum tolerated dose, plus ezetimide, plus PCSK9 inhibitors, and uh, uh, their LDL cholesterol levels uh, were not going below the uh, indicated threshold. If they add these uh, uh, aspects, uh, then they were eligible for uh, the uh, clinical trial. So we will see in the future where they will uh, go in terms of direction. But of course, I mean, being a new drug, uh, and as we already have very good drugs to control this lipidemia, the uh, window for application of uh, these uh, new compounds uh, will be restricted to uh, rare patients which are not responding to cheaper drugs, such what we have available right now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if there is no questions, uh, I, I, we have still three, five, five minutes to, for, the, for some questions. I have one. Um, we, we, we are now uh, uh, hearing about many immune-induced thrombocytopenia especially from AstraZeneca, from heparin. Is this thrombocytopenia is similar or what, what's the mechanism of it? I mean, for the one related to vaccine, you mean? Yeah, like, the one, no, the one related to angi angi no, angi no, no, no. Uh, like the, Yeah, so I, I want to be clear on this. Uh, I mean, uh, there are no data showing that uh, these uh, uh, compounds are inducing uh, thrombocytopenia. The observation with thrombocytopenia was related to an old uh, compound which, uh, with a similar mechanism of action, which is an antisense oligonucleotide directed toward uh, APOC3, okay. apolipoprotein C3. And uh, what is uh, clear now is uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, this side effect was related to the chemical design. So there were some phospholipids that were used to build up uh, the molecule that uh, were uh, uh, seen as uh, main components of the uh, platelets membrane. So there was a sort of attack of the immune system toward platelets due to the injection of these uh, compounds, the old compounds. That's why they changed, they redesigned completely the molecules. So the target is more intriguing, but even the designer is excluding any major impact on platelets. Okay, uh, so Rata, so okay. any, any uh, question? Oh, yes. Uh, Professor Norata, do you expect that these drugs in the future will get a, a step up to be used before Pesquenai, for example, or not? Uh, it's, it's too early to call for this decision. Uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, saving money for health systems, uh, perhaps uh, uh, they can be used before other approaches only for a, a very restricted number of patients. Uh, I'm thinking about this uh, null null homozygous FH, that they will definitely benefit from this compound. Okay, so thank you, Professor Norata. Thank so you. So, while uh, doctors, welcome, Dr. Alexandros. Um, and while you are sharing your presentation, uh, I, I, I have the honor to introduce uh, Professor Alexandros Sipilis. He is uh, the editor of uh, Hellenic Journal of Atherosclerosis and member of editorial board of various international journals including Vascular Disease Prevention, American Journal of Biochemistry and Biotechnology. He is an active member of the European Atherosclerosis Society and he is a dear friend and he attends with us the Cardio Risk in Hergada. I'd like to thank you very much for being with us. 
and I will leave the mic to Dr. Mohammed Selim to introduce the first the, the presentation of Dr. Alexandros. Dr. Selim is with us. Uh, yes. Selim. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. It's my honor to join this important international summit uh, of lipids. And it's my honor also uh, to introduce Professor uh, Alexandros Tisilibis, uh, a professor of biochemistry. And he will give us a talk about the omega-3, the biology function and evidence. Uh, professor Alexandros. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like first to thank uh, Professor Reda for this very kind invitation and uh, to congratulate all the organizing uh, committee for this uh, excellent program you have constructed. And, uh, uh, okay, uh, I will uh, talk about omega-3 fatty acids, the biology, the function and evidence, as you have asked me. Please inform me if it is okay, you see my slides and you hear me. <clears throat> yes. Okay, so uh, these are mm -hmm. my disclosures. And uh, just to start, we know that omega-3 fatty acids are free. These are essential fatty acids for humans. We know that uh, alpha-linolenic acid contains 18 carbon atoms and three double bonds. EPA, which is eicosapentaenoic acid, contains 20 carbon atoms and five double bonds. And uh, docosahexaenoic acid, DHA, 22 carbon atoms and six uh, double bonds. These are the structure of uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Where can we get these omega-3 fatty acids? For alpha-linolenic acid, we know very well that it exists in nuts and seeds as well as in vegetables. And we, if we should choose one source, we would choose the flax seed, which much enriched in this alpha-linolenic acid. And concerning EPA and DHA, we know that these are in, uh, these existing fishes. And if we, if we should choose some fishes, we would choose sardine herring and Atlantic salmon, which are enriched in both omega-3 fatty acids. But please pay attention here. <clears throat> if we eat a fish, we get these fatty acids because I will talk now more on fish fatty acids, DHA and EPA. We get these fatty, acid, uh, fatty acids in the form of triglycerides and phospholipids. If we extract the oil from the fishes, then we get these fatty acids in the form of triglycerides. But now there is technology to modify this, these sources. For example, if we get the triglycerides, remove the glycerol bond from this and put an ethanol molecule then we can create not now triglyceride of EPA or DHA, but we can create an omega-3 acid ethyl ester. And I will talk about uh, this later on in clinical trials. But there is another possibility. If we get the glycerol out of the triglyceride and we add just a hydrogen atom, then we transform these fatty acids in carboxylic acids. And I will talk also about this formulation later on. Which is the difference now in the absorption? Look here, we have here triglycerides and phospholipids enriched in, fat, in this omega-3 fatty acids. We need from the pancreas and also from the intestine uh, to uh, have the uh, specific lipases to hydrolase these molecules triglycerides and phospholipids in order to get these uh, fatty acids to go into the micelles to be absorbed. But if we have the ethyl ester of these fatty acids, then it is, it is more easy for our organism to hydrolyze, to remove the ethanol from here, and we need only one lipase, again for pancreas, carboxylester lipase, and then it is more easy to get these fatty acids to go into the micelles and to be absorbed. And also it is important to note that if we get as carboxylic acids as, as uh, free fatty acids, then you understand we don't need any 
any lipase here, it goes to the micelle and easily be absorbed. These are the differences, and this is the way that we get today uh, omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. Now, how are they metabolized? If we take uh, alpha-linolenic acid, then we need some metabolic steps in order to get eco-sipendanoic. In other words, if we eat uh, a, a plant with uh, uh, alpha-linolenic acid, then we have to realize that, yes, we will get the other also omega-3 fatty acids, EPA, and also DHA. If we eat EPA, it is also possible our organism to create DHA. Now, it is very important to note that both uh, EPA and DHA, it is possible they are metabolized in our cells and give, give rise to several metabolites which also exert activities as I will show you later on. And here we, saw, uh, we see from EPA through uh, 18 HIP and also 5 LOX lipoxygenase, we can get uh, the uh, E series of resolvins, bioactive molecules. And from DHA, we can also get uh, the D series of resolvins, also protectins and myrcins. These are bioactive molecules, and I will show you just some experiment, uh, some uh, uh, just some uh, examples. For example, let's we see here. We have eaten EPA. We have received EPA and DHA. First of all, the first activity we can see is on the mem cell membrane. Here is a cluster raft, and you know rafts contain the the receptors through which various molecules act on the cell. If we get these fatty acids, these fatty acids induce a declusteration of rafts. Okay, so here we have a cluster raft and we, here we have a declustered raft due to the incorporation of these fatty acids into the membrane. Is it is important? The answer is yes, of course, it is very important. And here is an, an example. Here is a receptor. After the ligand binds to the receptor, for example, TLR, we can have an inflammatory sign. But if we have omega-3 fatty acids incorporated here, we have a decluster receptor. This receptor cannot induce an inflammatory sign. So we have a reduction or we stop the inflammatory uh, signal within the cell. So this is a, keep in mind, this is a first mechanism. Another mechanism. There are receptors like this uh, G protein receptor 120. And look here, if we eat fatty acids, omega-3, these fatty acids bind to the receptor. And this receptor is internalized into the cells and exert, exert anti-inflammatory actions through uh, different and uh, uh, difficult mechanisms. This is the time, not the time now to start describing the mechanism. So, second mechanism, there are receptors for this omega-3 fatty acid. Third mechanism, these resolvins I showed you, there are receptors like this chem receptor 23, which receptors recognize these uh, metabolites. This is resolvin 1. And we can see here that, uh, that through this binding, we can influence several cell types this is just a figure concerning human macrophages. So another mechanism is through their metabolites. Now, it is very well known that omega-3 fatty acids, as well as their intracellular metabolites I had, I had mentioned uh, before, can activate PIPAR alpha and PIPAR gamma receptors. And through this activation, we can have a reduction of inflammation, both receptors if they are activated, and also we have we can have a reduction in uh, hyperlipidemia, an important reduction in triglycerides, and I will focus on uh, in the next slide to show you exact mechanism. So another mechanism that omega-3 uh, uh, PUFAs act 
are through activating PIPAR alpha and PIPAR gamma pathways. This is another example. Here we is the membrane, the cell membrane. Here we have EPA and DHA. And here we have their metabolites, resolvins. Look here, resolvin E1 can stop lipoxygenase and stop the production of uh, leukotrien uh, B4. These are metabolites of arachidonic acid. And these, have, these metabolites have inflammatory activities. So, resolvin 1 and resolvin D2 can stop the, this inflammatory pathway. But also, resolvin D2 can transform the proatherogenic macrophages 1 into the anti-atherogenic macrophage type 2. And we know that these are very important types of macrophage which influence the progression of atherosclerotic plaque. But also resolvin D2 and resolvin E1 can also activate PIPAR gamma following the, uh, the uh, procedure and the metabolism I described to you before. Through these mechanisms, what actions may P, uh, omega-3 can have on the cellular level? This is a complicated scheme. This is endothelial cells. And this scheme, what does it show? That omega-3 fatty acid can induce the formation of the basodilatory and platelet, a very, very important molecule for us, which is the uh, NO, nitrogen oxide. But also, they can stop the production of endothelin. They can induce the production of tissue plasminogen activator, which has a beneficial antithrobotic effect. They can also stop the, pro, the, the binding of oxidized LDL to the receptor and the, the uh, inducing into uh, endothelial cells pro-inflammatory uh, uh, activities. So these, are, these omega-3 fatty acids have beneficial effect on endothelium. But also not here. If we affect uh, uh, NO levels, then we uh, can affect uh, smooth muscle cells, so we, have, we can induce vasodilation. And this is also a complicated scheme, but please note, both omega-3 fatty acids, you see here, this is a symbol for DHJ, and this is the symbol for EPA. Both can have important vasodilatory effects on smooth muscle cells. In other words, both omega-3 can have anti-hypertensive effect through these complicated mechanisms. But also, this is also a complicated scheme, but please note that both omega-3 fatty acids can inhibit platelet activation, not only through ADP, but also collagen from B. Various, uh, various uh, uh, pathways acting on the expression of the receptors on the brain and also on the downstream uh, uh, signaling. So, note here anti platelet effects. And here is the most known effect of this omega acids. Excuse me, Alexandro, there is some uh, noise. Uh, please, uh, ICOM company to solve this. Okay, go ahead, Alexandro. Okay, so this is uh, the most known activity of omega-3. They influence the, tri the lower triglyceride levels. And we can see here, this is complicated, but look the arrows I have prepared. They stop the production and secretion of VLDL. Secondly, they induce the hydrolysis of VLTL, the triglycerides in plasma, through activation of lipoprotein lipase. So they induce the uh, lipolysis of uh, VLDL and the conversion of, of course, VLDL into LDL. And third mechanism, they stimulate the oxidation of fatty acids, not permitting these fatty acids, to be incorporated into triglycerides, so they stop in this way the synthesis of triglycerides, and it happens in liver cells, it happens in uh, muscle cells, it happens also in adipose tissues. 
No. To make a long story short, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, they protect endothelial cells. They stop the lipid accumulation. They stop vascular inflammation. They in, uh, stop the proliferation of smooth muscle cells into the atherosclerotic plant. And importantly, they also, through their anti-inflammatory activities, they stop plaque rupture, and also through their anti-thrombotic anti activities, they stop uh, uh, thrombus formation, so they stop atherothrombosis. Now, based on this uh, uh, knowledge I have provided to you, let's we go ahead and to see what the clinical studies have taught us. First of all, old clinical studies. We know very well the GC Prevenzioni, Jelly uh, study, GC Heart Failure study. These are the three studies which showed that with uh, by, by using omega-3 fatty acids, we can, we can reduce CV events. So these three studies uh, gave beneficial effects, positive results uh, by using omega-3 fatty acids. The first study used a mixture of EPA DHA, the jelly study only EPA, the GZ heart failure, uh, failure EPA DHA. So these studies gave positive results. But let's we see now what is what is going on with the recent studies which have been published. And this is one study the evolved to a trial. And we know here that there were 162 adults with elevated triglyceride levels. He, see here the levels, very high levels. So they had severe hypertriglyceridemia. And what uh, they did, they were randomized to receive for 12 weeks either olive oil, and this was the placebo group, or to receive a capsule, a panova, which contains both EPA and DHA. These are the percentages. And this is the total amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids this uh, drug contains. And let's we, we see the results. Here is the total reduction of triglyceride levels, a very important effect. But if we separate the people with very high levels of triglycerides, you see here the level, we had a more important reduction of triglycerides in this trial. So another result, this reduction was primarily due to the reduction of VLDL levels. So the endogenous triglyceride levels, but also we had a significant reduction of non-HDL cholesterol levels. And these are the conclusions of this study by using the carboxylic omega-3 fatty acid as a panova, two grams per day, we can have a significant reduction of triglycerides, so we may have a benefit towards the risk of acute pancreatitis and, of course, on the risk of cardiovascular disease. But let's we see now another study which indicated had opposite, uh, different results. This is the ASCENT study. In this study, uh, uh, 15 and half thousand of patients with diabetes mellitus, but without the evidence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, what they did, they received one gram of capsules contain these fatty acids. Okay, again, the same thing as I told you, or matching placebo, and here is olive oil. This is the ascent study. The mean follow up is 4.7.4 uh, years. And of course, the primary outcome, the first serious vascular event, as it is described here, not don't spend your time, is a classical uh, clinical endpoints that all most of studies use. Unfortunately, for the omega-3 fatty acid, this study was negative. So no difference between placebo and the group who received uh, uh, omega-3 uh, fatty acids. And this is a conclusion of the study. As I already told you, there was no significant difference in the incidence of serious vascular events between the two groups. And this study concludes Con con concludes 
that this trial does not support the current recommendation of routine dietary supplementation of omega-3 fatty acids. And let's we go the most, to the most known recent study, which is the Reduce It study. All we know the study, and I will go fast in the study, 8,000 patients with established CVD or with uh, uh, diabetes mellitus and other risk factors. They were receiving statin therapy. So there are levels of LDL where in this region, so very good levels, I could say. And the fasting triglycerides levels in this uh, uh, region between 135 and 499. And they received the ester of EPA, as I told you, this formulation, which is Ecosapent ethyl. And also, please note that they received four grams, two capsules per day. 4.9 years, the follow-up, and again, the same primary endpoint and so on. This study gave positive res results. An important reduction of the primary composite endpoint, and also an important reduction of the key secondary composite endpoint, which is, uh, uh, is the CV death, myocardial infarction, and stroke. And uh, if we note here, I should note here that even in patients with diabetes mellitus, there was the same benefit as in the overall uh, population. But please note there were some adverse events. The most important was uh, uh, atrial fibrillation and was uh, an increased number of patients were hospitalized for AF or flutter. Uh, these were the group uh, who received the uh, ethyl ester of uh, EPA. There were no difference concerning half heart failure and also marginally serious bl uh, bleeding events, and there were not fatal bleeding events. The statistical significance was not lower than 0.05. So we can consider there was a, ma a, a major difference between the two groups in bleeding events. These are the conclusions, and based on these results, the uh, uh, recent recommendations, the, the recent guidelines of the European Atherosclerosis Society and the European uh, Heart uh, uh, Ca Cardiology Society of Cardiology recommended that for due to the reduce it trial, that in high risk or very high risk patients with triglyceride levels between this range, 135 to 499, this was from this study, they reduce it, and uh, they were receiving anyway statin. In this type of patients, it is possible, it is recommended to use the ecosapendethyl, two grams, uh, uh, two capsules per day, so uh, in total, four grams. And now let's we go to the evaporate trial, in this trial, there were very, a small number of patients. They used the same Icosapent ethyl drug, but they measure the coronary uh, plaque volume. And the results of this study, although a small number of patients, and in, in, in such, uh, in somehow explain the results of the uh, reduce it trial. So they were doing, uh, uh, and geographically, they were studying the volume of plaque. Here are the patients, as I told you, small number, but difficult procedure to measure the plaque volume. So the coronary plaque volume. And these are the results. Important reduction of various types of plaques. We can see here, statistical significant of total non-classified plaque total plaque volume, very important results, with this, the same EPA uh, ethyl ester and the same uh, dose per day, four grams. And these are the conclusions that Icosapendenthyl plus statin, similar design to the reduce it, slowed coronary plaque progression and it did regression 
compared with statin plus plus uh, plus placebo and the study was uh, monitor monitoring patients for 18 months this was the follow up the follow up duration so this study may explain uh, in somehow the reduced it uh, results and let's we uh, continue with the strength uh, trial they used four grams per day of omega-3 carboxylic acid. This was the same as I told you. This was Epanova versus corn oil in 13,000 of statin treating patients with high severe risk, high severe risk, hypertrichidemia, and low levels of HDL cholesterol. And the primary again efficacy endpoint the same as I told you. Ladies and gentlemen, negative results. You know, we do not have any change in the MACE major adverse cardiovascular events in this with this trial published in 2020 in JAMA. And these are the conclusion of the strength randomized clinical trial that among statin treated patients with high CV risk, the addition of omega-3 carboxylic acid, this was Epanova versus corn oil, and these are we are given, these we are given on the background therapies, study and so on. No significant difference in the composite outcome of MESIS. And JAMA says that this finding do not support the use of this omega-3 fatty acid formulation to reduce MESIS in high risk patients. And ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, this is my final conclusion. Both fatty acids express several activities either directly or through their biologically potent mediator. And I told you this, there are several mechanisms. Also, both fatty acids, we know that reduce triglyceride levels and have also important effects in various ways. And I showed you in, in a slide on how can affect the atherosclerotic plaque development. But, but this is a question. Clinical studies have provided controversial results on the EPA and DHA clinical efficacy. Therefore, this is my opinion and also the opinion of several uh, authors uh, uh, dealing with the subject, recommend that further randomized controlled trials are needed to definitely prove the clinical efficacy of EPA and DHA towards atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And uh, I would be very happy if we could meet in Greece. We had a discussion with Professor Reda on how to proceed in the future. We are very close, both countries, and we have historically interaction for thousands of years. So this is the city I live. This is Ioannina uh, and uh, nice bridges. And always there is somewhere a, an ancient theater to attend tragedies during summer, but unfortunately now with COVID, <laughs> I'm not very optimistic we will have this chance at least next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was brilliant. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Alexandrus, and actually uh, uh, allow me to start the discussion of this uh, actually dynamic uh, field, uh, field of the omega-3 science. Uh, because we, uh, we have thought that omega-3, the main role is just to reducing the triglycerides, but it seems that they have a lot of mechanisms of action regarding the platelets, regarding the, uh, the uh, TPA, regarding the uh, inflammatory mechanisms, and so and so. Uh, uh, however, I think recently there was uh, a consensus of uh, European Astroscore Society about the combination therapy. And I noticed in this consensus that a statement that they again upgrade the level of phenofibrate uh, 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 and the combinations uh, in view of some side effects of the uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, you have any uh, uh, implication on this idea? Yes, the combination of a statin with a fibrate or the use of fibrates in another type of patients, it, but it is always, it always exists. As I told you from the recommendations and from the guidelines of 2019, 
the only the icosapent ethyl of four grams was recommended through these guidelines in a specific type of patient with high and very high risk and with increased triglyceride levels despite the statin therapy. Because as we know, if we have increased triglyceride levels, the first drug we should get is a statin. And on top of statin then, if we are not able to reduce triglycerides and we, as we are high and very high risk, then we can use the omega-3 fatty acids. But also there are other types, if I can use, uh, uh, show you again the slide I showed you with the guidelines. There, of course, uh, fibrates are recommended. This is not a drug that we should forget. Uh, excuse me, how we can explain the conflicting results between uh, different trials, um, uh, whether it's a, a study design, the, the formulation used, the type of the patients, uh, the primary, how can you explain this? This is my first question. The second one, um, uh, I I'm also uh, recently heard about uh, the use of omega-3 fatty acids as a protective for mental health to prevent the occurrence of the Alzheimer disease, sometimes used also in some children disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, uh, is it approved now uh, in the guidelines for neurological disorder or mental health for these omega-3 fatty acids? Thank you. Yes, to start from, the, from your second question, there are several other activities I did not describe to you because my talk today was focused on atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. But there are also several studies showing a beneficial effect even in cancer patients. But uh, I focus today on atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And there are several mechanisms that if there is, if it's necessary, we can discuss also uh, later on. Now, concerning your first uh, uh, question, this is very important question and I know, we know that there are unexplained uh, results. Why, why this, uh, there is this big difference between various clinical trials? One possibility could be the comparator. Some studies have used olive oil. Yeah. Some studies used uh, another types of oil. And if we compare with this, uh, this background, with this control group, so if we have different control group, then we may have some differences in this. But the other thing is, I did not show you data that uh, if we have a supplement and this supplement contains omega-3 fatty acids, a, 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 a big amount of these omega-3 fatty acids are getting oxidized, are oxidized. So we think that we get these fatty acids but these fatty acids are not indeed uh, as it should be. Uh, in other words, these are not real omega-3 fatty acids, but these are omega-3 oxidized fatty acids, okay? Uh, so the other thing is the difference in the dose. The trials that gave positive results were trials using ecospend ethyl, four grams, okay? And if you observed in these trials I, I showed you, there were differences, one gram or two grams. So it seems that it is also important uh, concerning this difference in the uh, clinical uh, trials. Some of them gave positive results, some of them did not give positive results. So, uh, to, to conclude on, on this, there is no question about the beneficial effect of omega-3 fatty acids at the cellular level. We know very well the mechanism by which these fatty acids act. Now, we need, in my opinion, more studies and to clarify the exact amount of fatty acid we should receive of certain type. As I showed you, there are carboxylic acid fatty acids, ethyl ester fatty acids, and also supplements and mixtures. 
Concerning the mixtures, there are differences on, uh, among, uh, between EPA and DHA in some activities. This is also should be clarified. Okay, so the positive results of reduce it and the other studies are with IPE, ethyl ester of EPA, four grams. Let's we keep it in mind. And there are other differences concerning the mixture. Okay, as I showed you, Epanova, for example, it contains both EPA and DHA, and also other fatty acids in this formula. Okay, so in my opinion, we need studies with a purified fatty acid with a certain type for formulation to conclude on how many grams we should use. For example, four grams, we need more than one gram because as I showed you, these are metabolized in our body. And also these are very sensitive to, to oxidation. And we had not taken into account this also, okay? These are very easily oxidized, okay? So these are some, some discussion that I could do this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alexandros for this uh, inciting uh, talk. And now we'll move to the next session. And I, wel I want to welcome Professor Mohammed Sobhi, the president of uh, IAVA and chairman of the annual Cardio Alex uh, Conference, uh, Professor Said Farag, generally general secretary of IAVA Society, and Professor Ahmed Al Kirsch, uh, the uh, treasurer of IAVA Society. Uh, so uh, while Dirk is pre preparing his uh, 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 presentations, uh, Dirk is a uh, uh, professor of clinical department of cardiology, University Clinic of Internal Medicine, Medical University of Graz. I leave the mic to Professor Sobhi if he is with us to introduce this presentation. Dr. Sobhi, further. Dr. Sobhi, unmute your mic, please. Okay. Hello, Dr. Asher. Thank you very much for uh, for this wonderful uh, International Lipid Summit. I think it's uh, uh, the, the advent of uh, the virtual meeting that we can see a lot of international speakers virtually easier than physically, but uh, it's well prepared. I I heard all the speakers before. I think this time now to come to the um, the last speaker, which is the innovation of uh, uh, SIMRNA. As you know, that's mRNA now, uh, now for the vaccine of Pfizer. So uh, is it the future twice to have this uh, uh, technique in uh, treatment of uh, refractory, as we said that, or resistant hypercholesteremia, I think it, this is very important to have it. The difficulty that you have a statin for 20, 30, uh, 365 days, and we have uh, PCS9 uh, every two weeks, 26 injections. Now, if you have an injection twice yearly, it will be easier, but is it valuable or not? I think this, uh, uh, the speaker will, uh, will show us uh, what the benefit of this uh, drug, how, this, how it works, and what are the trials. The floor is yours. Okay, Thank you very Dr. Much indeed, Dirk, please go ahead. I am, uh, am I already on? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's okay. Yes, we hear you. I, can see. Okay. Okay. I, I wasn't sure. Yeah. So <laughs> yes, um, I feel more than honored than having the opportunity to refer a little bit on RNA-based cholesterol lowering therapy and I apologize that I have to like replace Professor Zirlik, who unfortunately had been indisposed at a very short time, and I hopefully will be able to fill this gap appropriately. These are my conflicts of interest, and the first slide I'd like to share with you is the one we are talking about today, I think, uh, for the whole meeting. We have, and this is a child's vessel, um, we start our career as human beings with nice vessels, but even if we get old healthy, they degenerate to a certain extent. And unfortunately, many of our patients with risk factors, um, this degeneration accelerates. And as patients get older and older, many of them have cardiovascular events. 
And these risk factor we focus today is hypercholesterolemia and hypercholesterolemia, as many of the other risk factors, finally lead to vascular inflammation. And as we all know, this vascular inflammation is one of the very most important triggers to factor cardiovascular events. And we are not able to visit her for months now, but hopefully soon we'll be able to visit Paris and Mona Lisa. And if you get a close look, which is difficult for all of these tourists, but you could appreciate that she has xanthelasmas and xanthomas as we had. And as I said, as people are getting older, they get the effects which might not have been seen earlier. And we do see the same aspects as we do see with Mona Lisa in our patients as well, suffering from hypercholesterolemia. And there is, and I think this is a very, very important concept, a threshold concept you might be aware of anyway, but it's a little bit like smoking, where we count pack years and then these add up to a certain risk patients have. And you can take these scheme to LDL levels in your blood. And we know from patients with homocytous def defects of the LDL receptor resulting in very high LDL levels that these patients develop cardiovascular disease in adolescence. And the ones with heterozygous defects also get these problems of cardiovascular disease in their early adult ship. And then it depends on the risk factors I've already mentioned as smoking, diabetes, hypertension. And we know that male sex might be disadvantages, whereas female sex to a certain extent is advantages to get to a higher threshold and to have a less steep increase as like normal individuals have. But besides all this shade, there's some light as well. And this led to the development of PCSK9 interfering drugs because mutations resulting in less PCSK9 led to less steeper effect even than normals. And the threshold for cardiovascular disease is sometimes only reached at an age the patients do not reach due to other diseases. So obviously, if you can reduce PCSK9 from the very early days, you might never get cardiovascular disease. And therefore, the concept of interacting with this protein is very intriguing. And you're probably also aware of this linear correlation shown in many meta-analysis, uh, meta like the one with almost 100,000 patients I'd like to share with you, where you can show for all the statin trials, for example, that every reduction in LDL reduces in a reduction in cardiovascular events. That works very well. And a very similar relationship can be drawn from various genetic alterations with patients having genetically high LDL levels and those with lower LDL levels. And again, you get a linear correlation. And the really interesting point in this is if you plot this regression into the other plot, it is much steeper. And this makes all the difference because if you are genetically uh, gifted with low LDL, you have this benefit from the very, very early days. And in all these interventional statin trials, you start treatment if patients are 40, 60, or even 70 years old, and the damage of the vessels already took place, and you only manage to reduce a very high risk, um, but it would be much more appreciable if you could start earlier. The relevance of the LDL and the LDL receptor is already seen in the 80s and even before. So in, in 1985, Goldstein and Brown uh, were uh, rewarded with a Nobel Prize for that. And I believe that the impact of LDL was probably still not seen to full extent at that days and is even greater in our days. 
the last slide on the LDL correlation and this led to the dogma we are, I think, all live the lower the better because in the CTT collaboration, the cholesterol treatment trialist collaboration, having the data of all the trials done with statins and this already 10 year old meta analysis has the data of 170,000 participants of 26 randomized trials shows that it's completely independent of the baseline LDL that you get a 21 or 22 percent reduction with every reduction in LDL by one molar uh, almost being uh, 38.5 milligram per deciliters. That is the rational for the dogma, the lower the better. And all this data, of course, got into the 2019 dyslipidemia guidelines of the ESC. And the concept was a little bit shifted in these new guidelines as we now discriminate four entities of patients. The ones we probably hardly ever see, at least not in the hospitals, are the ones with a really low risk a score value of less than 1%. Of course, these patients only have to be reduced to less than 160 milligram per deciliters. Still, at least in Styria, Austria, many patients are above this level. And still, the moderate risk patients with a score between 1 and 5%. And this might also be young patients with type 1 diabetes, but very young age, or type 2 diabetes with still rather young age, or a diabetes duration of less than 10 years without any other risk factors. There's still moderate risk, but if we're honest with ourselves, this is not the patients we usually see in the hospital. I think in the hospitals, we rather see the high risk patients score 5 to 10 percent, markedly alternatively markedly elevated single risk factors or familiar hypercholesterolemia with, uh, without other major risk factors. Even the huge cohort of patients with moderate kidney disease, GFR between 30 and 60, or diabetes without target organ damage. And still very many patients will probably qualify for the very high risk group with a score more than 10%. And these are very difficult to treat with the drugs we had available for years and maybe decades to reach LDL levels below 55 milligram per deciliter. This is a concentration of LDL in the blood newborn babies have, many other wild animals have. This is probably like a healthy LDL level, but very difficult to reach especially if you are on Western diet. Therefore, before we now talk on different aspects of medical therapy, our first step need always needs always to be management of lifestyle from this phenotype to maybe a rather that phenotype. And we also know that there is a good level of evidence and a reasonably reasonable magnitude of effects if we avoid dietary trans fats, if we succeed in reducing dietary saturated fats, if we increase dietary fibers, use functional food with phytosterols, use red yeast, or uh, reduce excessive body weight, and maybe a little bit less evidence and less treatment effect as with several other aspects. But having all this in mind, and having that discussed for years and maybe decades, we still have the data of the Da Vinci Initiative published in 2019, it's not very old data. And what we can see is that, of course, the very low intensity statins is little treatment in these patients, overall cohort. And then you have it discriminated from the low, moderate, high risk and very high risk patients. But what we do see is that the moderate intensity statin monotherapy is still the most frequent therapy we have in daily practice, almost 50% of the patients. The high intensity statin monotherapy is in 20 and at least in the high risk patients, maybe up to 40% of the patients. We do see combinations with acetamide, 
but we see a very, very low proportion of patients being on PCSK9 treatment. So I'd like to come to the next point that we have new strategies addressing PCSK9, and I do not want to address antibodies today, as you're very familiar with their mode of action, I suppose, but we have targeting PCSK9 several possibilities to interact with the plasma PCSK9 activity, the expression or the secretion. And the one that works best, and we already have a drug, is silencing RNA. And what is the mode of action? The mode of action is that the synthetic silencing RNA gets into the cells and interacts with the cleavage process and therefore degenerating um, uh, messenger RNA and therefore targeting gene slicing. And this leads to less PCSK9 and therefore lower levels of uh, serum LDL. The drug Inclisiran is already approved in Europe um, with the name Lequio. We get familiar with it over time. And the rationale for that and the scientific basis and the clinical trials basis is mainly a real 10 and L11. In the later part of today's meeting, we get an even closer insight into the urea program. And we're all awaiting the, I think, 15,000 patients trial urea on four, but we have robust data already. As you can see on the upper panel, the urea 10 trial led to a significant and consistent reduction of LDL using Inclisiran every six months. And the same was true with the urea 11 trial. And if you like merge this data in this table, you do see that adverse events are significantly reduced um, um, with um, uh, 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 slightly reduced, sorry, with um, 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 Inclisiran, but the serious adverse events, and this is probably more important, are significantly reduced, as you can see here, for the Orion 10 trial and the Orion 11 trial. And even other cardiovascular adverse events, and these are the pre-specified exploratory cardiovascular endpoint, is, as you can appreciate, reduced from 10.2 to 7.4 in Rio 10, and from 10.3, very consistent to 7.8 with Inclisiran. So this seems to work with respect to maze or other cardiovascular events, but it has a price there are more injection side adverse events with Inclisiran, as you can see here, but these are mainly mild and some are moderate. And therefore, the overall benefit, I think, uh, seems to be very favorable. Before we might discuss this data, and as I already pointed out, we'll get more information on the Orion program in the later part of today's meeting. I'd like to share two recent studies, or the one is not as recent as the, as the others, on statins, because the problem we do have with statins in my eyes is not that these are really, really good drugs, but for whatever reason, there is a significant proportion of our patients that do not want to take statins or that believe and even get side effects of statins. Despite these two very interesting trials, I'd just like briefly to share with you. One was the one on nocebo effect from patients from the ESCA trial. These were patients treated um, with statin and they had hypertension, dyslipidemia, and at least three other risk factors. At that time, they got atrovastatin and placebo and was not blind, and it was de blinded in the end. And some patients got on using atorvastatin. And this is now shown in this table. And as you can see, in the blinded phase of the ASCA trial, muscle-related problems were not different in both groups. But once patients knew they were taking statins, and that's not to annoy us, but it happens, they got um, muscle-related problems. Although, on the other hand, if patients are 
in the blinded phase of the study, you had less sleep disturbance with statins, but once you know you have to get a statin and not placebo, this effect is gone. And the second one I'd like to share with you is a rather recent one with a very nice design, I think, that had been animated to the New England Journal, despite the fact that it was only 60 patients with known statin-induced adverse events, or um, uh, they had to stop statin therapy for a um, side effects. And these patients were treated with, for a month each, either atorvastatin, 20 milligram placebo, or no tablets at all. And interestingly, the average number of patients with, sorry, uh, with um, symptoms was only 8% in those taking no tablet at all. Therefore, you should consider they get no symptoms at all. But with placebo, it doubled, but there was no further increase with statins. The point I'd like to make with these two trials is statins, in my eyes, is a very good drug, but we won't be able to get our patients on this drug in every case. And as we want to reach very low target levels, we need to have other drugs. And therefore, my conclusions are there is a proportional correlation um, of LDL and cardiovascular events, as you're all aware of. And the correlation starts at the day of birth or maybe even before. And the earlier we would start treatment and the better we do, the better our results will be. New low goals and the guidelines can only be achieved with very intense treatment and statins will not be enough. And Inclisiran as a silencing RNA marks a new potent class of medication we will now have available. It is characterized by strong LDL reduction as PCSK9 antibodies and a very low number of relevant side effects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Derek, uh, for uh, this wonderful lecture. Uh, I understand from your talk that uh, for the PCS9, this is the era of uh, secretion, uh, expression, and then action or the signaling. So uh, do you think that according to what you say that it start early, that this could be the drug of primary prevention rather than the secondary prevention? Because on, or because if you start to prevent from the beginning from the secretion, I think this is better than uh, to make it after because it will add, add to what we have, but the others will not have the same benefit like starting early. Uh, you understand my, 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 my philosophy for, because this is, it's, it's a PCS9 secretion, expression, and then signaling. So if you go stop secretion, so you stop the process, so you can start early. I know that's important the secondary, but maybe maybe we need to more, do more, more, more and more investigations and trials on the primary rather than the secondary. Yes, no, I, I completely agree. But also, of course, knowing that trials and primary prevention are very, very difficult to conduct. But um, at least my view is a very easy one. So LDL has to be low. And the way to reduce LDL should be um, paved with very little side effects. And the earlier you achieve these low levels in LDL, the better. Therefore, yes, in principle, it would be like a yearly vaccination for influenza, for example. You get your syringe and your injection and you'll have lower LDL levels that might work. I believe that it's still a costly therapy. It's still a therapy you have to apply once a year. I think once we get even more confident that a lifelong reduction of LDL is beneficial for patients or for, for people which are not even patients yet, I think um, a vaccination given early will be the... Um, the solution in the end that yeah maybe already young children or at least adolescents will get a reduction of the LDL that maybe even lasts even longer than with Inclisera, but it would be a nice step into this direction. Okay, any questions? Well, uh, I, 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 yeah, have, I a, have a question. Okay, Annie, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, go. On. Okay, um, number one, Dirk, I want to thank you for your time and for the fantastic presentation. I also like to thank the previous two speakers. 
And I think the last two slides, the uh, two slides before the conclusion, the ones about uh, the statin side effects being mainly in the mind are extremely important because statins are facing a huge onslaught of conspiracy theorists. Exactly this, what we're suffering with the COVID vaccines now is the same type of sick mentality which scares patients and, uh, and uh, makes them worry and brings a lot of symptoms into their minds, which can really happen in only a fraction of patients. My question is, because Egypt is a poor country and we have to really look, and by the way, I'm super hot about using PCS K9 and Clizeron when it comes. Uh, but I want to ask you something specific. I read that the reduction that you get with a suprastatin maximum dose when tolerated plus azetimibe is actually slightly larger than a PCSK9 or Enclisiron on its own without a statin. Saying, if I get a patient without familiar hypercholesteremia, say with an LDL of 180, who's already had a coronary event, and they tolerate Rosuva statin 40 plus azetimibe, I might be able to bring them down to below 55 more than if I use a PCSK9 alone without a statin at all. Of course, the combination is the best. So my question, my point is that uh, because this is some pharma pressure which is happening in Egypt, uh, trying to use, and I hate it when pharma, which is promoting PCSK9 or Clitoron, tries to focus on statin side effects because that is so counter constructive, you know, and, and they want to push the drugs to patients who are on a small dose of statin, not because of side effects, just because they scale. So I want to get, uh, do you agree that a patient on Rosuva statin 40 plus azetimibe would get the same LDL reduction compared to a patient on a PCSK9 without any additional treatment? That's a question. And uh, do you agree that there has to be some statin with those drugs, or can they be used on their own? So, second uh, prevention. yeah, to address your first question, I think on average, I totally agree. A potent statin is of the same value reducing LDL as PCSK9 antibodies or Inclisiran is, but it is uh, there are huge individual differences. We do see patients on intensive statin therapy that do not react, but we also see patients on PCSK9 inhibitors that do not have strong effects. So there are individual differences. And I think once we get, and as we get more and more into more individualized therapy, this plays a role as well. I am very very confident with um, now the huge process we do see in RNA derived therapies. And I think this is one of the huge benefits we have from the pandemic that the field and the understanding of mRNA and RNA treatments got so much larger and bigger. And the production facilities and the knowledge how to produce these drugs increased tremendously and at least to my best knowledge is rather uh, cheap um, so uh, rna production of course it's still expensive but compared to antibodies it's probably much cheaper and so i'm confident that within a few years and you of course have all these patents and there's a lot of um, of, of development costs in it but once you have it and you have an easy process to produce these drugs I very much hope that in a few years' time, we have a cheap alternative to statins. Statins will be cheap as they're all generic. So if you want me to say, uh, if we're a patient for a few more years, we have a fantastic and probably cost-effective arsenal of lipid-lowering drugs. And it's only a few years with very high costs we have to face in the very close future. And there are few... Okay. Can I have a question? Excuse me. Father, father. Derek, uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you think uh, if we compare statin therapies, and uh, what we hear now, uh, what about the genetic variants? Because we knew that the BISC-9 inhibitors and Inclus run uh, are acting on all the genetic variants, especially in patients with uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, and this is not uh, done with 
his status. You agree with what I say? Yes, I do uh, agree. I completely agree. And I think it shuts the light again to more individualized treatment. We really have to know our patient and then decide what's best for him. Yeah. So complete question, yeah. I threw out of the same question like you. Uh, my question was, it is you have a responders and non-responders? I mean, because depending on the genetic signaling yeah. on this kind of because it's it's so the, it's a signaling so i'm i'm my signaling is different from your signal yeah. so it's sometimes i'm not responder to this drug you are responders how can you differentiate between these yeah i think sometimes it's trial and error so i i know one of our colleagues who, who uh, uh, was then seen with acute myocardial infarction after that we treated him and he has hypercholesterolemia and we didn't succeed very well with statins and then we put him on a pcsk nine um, antibody and he dropped down below 20 and even after we uh, got rid of the statins he he stayed below 20 so he's like a super responder for pcsk9 mm. but a bad responder for statins but i'm sure the complete opposite is seen in another patient that responds very well to statin but these are the patients we would not switch to pcsk9 so we do have less experience with those but there are, we know that from the trials, there are several patients that do not respond to PCSK9. And I think it will be worth trying because before you start doing a whole genetic program on the patient to uh, know in advance how he might react, you just try with a drug that has little side effects and then you know. I think okay. Norata can uh, tell us the pharmacological impact of these uh, questions. Yes, of course, I mean, uh... We really need to be careful about the different possibilities. Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, how we can uh, move forward toward uh, uh, the development uh, in terms of uh, loss of function or uh, gain of function mutations. Uh, if we have a patient with gain of function, while monoclonal antibodies will be less effective, a gene silencing approach will silence the gene anyhow. So we could uh, really... Uh, think uh, that uh, uh, we could have a beneficial approach uh, using gene silencing uh, with patients that perhaps have a gain of function mutation of PCSK9 in this specific example, but this will be valid for all uh, the emerging treatments uh, in terms of gene silencing approaches. Okay, so uh, if there is no other uh, questions, uh, I, I think... I just uh, want to say a quick comment, Brandy. Professor. Yeah, just a very quick comment. Uh, I recently had a, it's anecdotal, but it, it's funny, but it might be interesting. I recently had a patient who uh, at a very young age, and both his parents had had bypass before the age of 50, uh, developed coronary artery disease. His LDL was 220. And I gave him a maximum statin and azitimibe, and he did not reach the target. So I added PCSK9. And I only waited for two weeks uh, 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 to add the PCSK9. And for about a month, or meaning like he received the first two doses and there was zero response. So um, anyway, um, I decided that I want to give him the injections myself. So I asked him to come to my office. I had taught him how to give the injections for himself and I'd given him a video and I started giving him the injections myself. And within, lo and behold, within one month, he dropped his LDL to 26. And I'm totally at loss to why this happened. I don't know if he was not getting the drug or if he was injecting it in a wrong way or, you know. So, you know, I would just like to make a point that it's very easy to get our patients uh, to a healthcare facility near their houses to have the medicines injected. And I think that we have an amazing opportunity to guarantee a 100% compliance with the drug if we do this even more so with Inclisiron. Just imagine if you actually have one of your nurses injected twice a year and not have the patient self-inject. I know how convenient it is for patients to self-inject, but I urge you to look at this point if in your non-responders, at least. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think, uh, Derek, now we shift to the second, the third, uh, uh, I think that the third part or the first part of the webinar, the starting with Dr. Ashraf Reda about the atherosclerotic uh, gen genetic uh, risk in emerging countries. Dr. Ashraf Reda, Professor of Cardiology, President IAVA, and Director of Egyptian Cardio Risk Projects. 
Thank you, Professor Sobhi. And uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, this presentation is uh, uh, to give some insights on the uh, uh, risk evaluation of the patients and the uh, genetic risk in Egypt and some uh, uh, other similar uh, country. Actually, as we know, this is what we have now uh, to risk stratify our patients. Uh, uh, studies the age, uh, some risk factors, and putting the patients in uh, four risk categories, low, moderate, high, or very high risk. This is excellent, but however, this is not enough because uh, uh, a lot of patients uh, is uh, uh, seen to have premature atherosclerosis and uh, maybe have atherosclerosis with uh, minimal of these risk factors. So it seems that we have to be prepared for a, a more advanced way of risk stratification of our patients to understand the genetic burden that may lead to premature uh, atherosclerosis. Uh, uh, in Egypt, we have, uh, in the last uh, uh, few years, the results of the cardio risk uh, projects, which a uh, uh, project aimed uh, mainly at studying what is the risk factor of Egyptian patients admitted with acute coronary syndrome, uh, what is the clinical and age, uh, mean age of these uh, patients, what the most important risk factors. And actually, one of the striking uh, uh, um, results is the a percentage of patients with premature atherosclerosis. Uh, um, nearly half of our patients admitted with acute coronary syndrome uh, uh, are considered by stand, uh, 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 worldwide standard as uh, the cases of premature atherosclerosis. As you know, uh, the reason for premature atherosclerosis is either multiple risk factors, uh, maybe uh, some forms of heterozygous, uh, heter heterozygous familial hypercholesteremia, and maybe uh, uh, other polygenic uh, mutations in many genes that may affect uh, these patients, make him liable to uh, premature uh, atherosclerosis. If you look at the some worldwide data about the prevalence and possibility of familial hypercholesterolemia among patients with premature atherosclerosis, uh, it is clear that compared to patients with uh, 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 um, uh, acute carcinoma in general, Patients with premature atherosclerosis have nearly uh, 50% uh, prevalence of uh, uh, possibility or probability of familial hypercholesterolemia. So actually, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, increased prevalence of patients with uh, premature atherosclerosis points to the uh, uh, importance of genetic studies of uh, many population at risk. This is an important paper on the overview of the current status of familial hypercholesterolemia in over 60 countries, and it points to the uh, uh, results of our uh, uh, data from the cardio risk projects about the possibility of uh, high prevalence of uh, heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia in patients who is premature atherosclerosis. So what's our knowledge now uh, about genetics? I think in the last uh, uh, tens of years, uh, our knowledge were mainly concerned about familial hypercholesterolemia. We know that familial hypercholesterolemia uh, uh, is a rare disease. It's uh, a monogenic disorder in uh, uh, one of the genes affecting lipid metabolism. Uh, however, these mutations or monogenic uh, abnormalities can affect individuals and families. Uh, it is really uh, have no uh, massive effect on population level. Uh, maybe the, the, the prevalence is one in uh, now considered to be one in 18,000 or according to whether homozygous or heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, this is uh, uh, most uh, commonly affected genes in familial hypercholesterolemia, LDL receptor, PSK9 gene, APOB genes, uh, however, as I told you, this is a monogenic defect, and this is affects certain individuals, a rare disease, and affects some families, uh, of course. Uh, how to diagnose, how to expect familial hypercholesterolemia? Uh, you have uh, five uh, columns or five pillars for the diagnosis. The family history is very important. The clinical history for the patient itself of having a premature atherosclerosis. Uh, uh, physical examination, presence of dentomas. Cornea arcus, the very high LDL level 
whether it is above 190 milligram per deciliter in adult or, or maybe above 155 milligram per deciliter in, the, in those less than 16 years old. Of course, the DNA examination or DNA analysis to detect the gene uh, mutation is uh, uh, diagnostic. However, you have to uh, put all this in mind while diagnosing. Another important uh, but rare also disease, uh, uh, but presence in emerging countries uh, is the uh, uh, genetic disorders, uh, lipoprotein little a. Lipoprotein little a actually is an important genetic, it is rare, rare. Uh, we don't know the uh, uh, real prevalence among patients with premature atherosclerosis, but this is a paper from India uh, 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 saying that lipoprotein little a, an under-recognized genetic risk factor for malignant coronary artery disease in young Indians. And um, uh, lipoprotein little a does not lead only to uh, the atherosclerosis that, ca that can be caused by LDL cholesterol, because actually it is really an LDL uh, uh, lipoprotein uh, 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 particles. However, with additions of these uh, 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 crangles, uh, that leads to ad another important uh, pathological mechanism, which is atherothrombosis. So lipoprotein A can lead to atherosclerosis, can lead to atherothrombotic effects, can lead to inflammatory effects, and uh, clinically it leads to on, not only coronary artery disease, but it increases the prevalence of coronary artery disease, aortic stenosis, and congestive heart failure. So I, do we need to know more than that about uh, uh, genetics and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? I think uh, it is not enough to uh, uh, study these monogenic rare conditions of homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, they are important. However, they are affecting, as I told you in the beginning, individuals and families. It, is, it has no uh, extensive effect on population level. So uh, what about the polygenic disorders uh, versus this monogenic rare disease? We have to know that in our body, we are born with hundreds of risk alleles that are related to atherosclerosis. We have risk alleles in our body related to blood pressure. This is the, uh, the list of the risk allele affecting the blood pressure. The, this is the list, uh, the list of risk alleles affecting lipid metabolism, new vascularization angiogenesis, angiogenesis NO signaling, inflammations, vascular remodeling, and, and unknown. And this is a number of abnormal or risk alleles that can lead to coronary disease that was, uh, this paper was in 2018, uh, there was uh, more than 160, 164 coronary disease risk loci that is uh, significantly related to the presence of, uh, of uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular. I'm sure now we have uh, more, uh, maybe more than 300 or even more and more uh, risk loci are discovered uh, each, each year. Thanks God, we are born with these risk alleles. In the, in the same times, we are born with neutralizing risk alleles that neutralize some of these uh, risk loci. And the net results or the burden of atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease depend on the balance between this risk loci and the neutralizing one that antagonized uh, many of them. And thanks God, also we can modify these situations by lifestyle interventions, by controlling blood pressures, by good, uh, good treatment for lipid meta, uh, abnormalities, we can neutralize many of these uh, risk alleles. Uh, if we look at the, our results from the prevalence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk factor in Egyptian patients with acute coronary syndrome from the cardiovascular uh, projects, we will notice that despite the, the high prevalence of premature atherosclerosis, they are characterized by the uh, presence of uh, many risk factors. Uh, uh, so maybe this multi-gene effect, this polygenic uh, uh, risk for CHI is very important on population level, and we, we should uh, take care of uh, antagonizing their effects. Uh, our patients have abdominal obesity, 60, more than 60% of patients. Uh, um, Current smoking, around 50% of patients with acute coronary syndrome in Egypt are currently smoking. Uh, type 2 diabetes, 
uh, hypertension in 46%, and this is the male-female distribution of the risk factors. So actually, uh, uh, the, the presence of multiple risk factors can uh, uh, point to uh, uh, the importance of this uh, uh, risk loci or polygenic uh, mutation or, or SNPs that are present in our body that we are born with. And as uh, uh, all the previous speaker uh, 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 mentioned, the importance of early initiation of uh, 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 risk, uh, cardiovascular risk prevention strategy, uh, whether uh, lifestyle interventions and even uh, uh, some drugs or therapeutic intervention for those high risk for developing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in the future. So actually, we are born with hundreds of genes involved in modulating the our coronary disease risk. We have to uh, 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 look at the rare uh, familial hypercholesterolemia mutations, uh, which are monogenic, like uh, homozygous and heterozygous. These are important. However, if we look at population level, if you look at the cardiovascular prevention on population level, we should look uh, uh, more importantly at the uh, common SNPs and the, this uh, risk uh, loci presence and those patients who are genetically predisposed. Uh, and as you know all, that genetic risk scoring systems are now being uh, uh, introduced and added to the uh, uh, actual or uh, risk scores uh, we have that does not put in consideration the genetic predisposition for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Uh, it is not uh, okay. Slides is not going on. However, I, I can conclude now that uh, uh, it is very important to determine the uh, the genetic burden for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Early detection for those at risk for developing atherosclerosis is very important if we want to fight these uh, uh, epidemics of atherosclerosis uh, and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and the premature atherosclerosis. Uh, monogenic defects are important, but this leads to rare diseases, affective individuals and some families, they are important. However, uh, polygenic effect that can uh, affect uh, uh, blood pressures, uh, lipid metabolism, blood glucose metabolism, obesity genes. Uh, all these gene loci are very important uh, to um, uh, prevent, if you want to prevent cardiovascular disease. Uh, and thank you for your attention. And I lead this stage for discussion if you want. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Professor Ashraf, for this uh, uh, actually a very fantastic presentation, and I think it will be the future now in uh, managing the dyslipidemia and atherosclerosis uh, to 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 have a dive in the uh, genetic burden uh, of the pre uh, prematurely uh, uh, affected uh, patients. Uh, and I'd like to ask you uh, about and and I have also we have the privilege. <coughs> Now that we have Professor Murata with us, uh, what is the current status of uh, the genetic measuring uh, uh, of the different centers uh, in Europe and uh, your experience here in Egypt, Professor Ashraf, about the uh, measuring the genetic uh, uh, burden and the polygenic affection? Well, Dr. Murata, you have a genetic uh, lab, I think, in the center you have? Yes, 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 indeed. But uh, us, go, go uh, ahead, you first, or do you want me to comment first? No, you, 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 please go ahead and comment on so, this. Uh, what, what I can tell you at the national level, uh, we have a project which is called Lipigen, and you can guess from the name that is genetic of lipids. So we are collecting uh, all the uh, information uh, which are uh, uh, collected by single lipid centers throughout the country. And then uh, through a, an approved uh, clinical protocol, the DNA is collected and is centralized to our center where it's sent for uh, uh, genetic testing. And then we come back to patients uh, with uh, the type of genetic mutation. Of course, there are some criteria uh, to decide to send out the uh, sample for characterization. So usually you need to provide according to uh, MedPed or other scores uh, that uh, the chances of uh, uh, facing 
uh, familiar hypercholesterolemia are elevated, and then these patients enter a full characterization. Okay, I think unfortunately in Egypt we have no uh, 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 genetic lab specific for lipids. We have some labs that can do uh, some genetic tests telling us that this patient has uh, uh, what is the cardiovascular risk score of him. I, I don't know uh, the reliability of uh, such uh, uh, tests and how it could implicate uh, our decision making in uh, managing uh, uh, the patient. If a healthy individual, for example, find himself by genetic testing liable to have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in the future. Uh, he may improve some lifestyle interventions. <coughs> uh, I don't know whether this could be one of the risk modifiers in the future, like uh, carotid intimability thickness, like APOB testing. We, we can, in, uh, at some level, Thank doing you. this Doctor, cardiovascular see. genetic scoring system uh, score, uh, uh, to put the patient <laughs> to, uh, from risk category to another risk category. I think this is the only implication that can I add in this uh, paragraph. Professor Henny, you have a comment or question? Yes, I have both a comment and a question. Uh, my comment is that even though precision medicine is very attractive, and the idea of uh, individualizing medicine is very attractive, uh, but um, we are treating a very common condition, and uh, mass treatment is still, um, at this point in time, the way to go, except for individual patients with variations. And for that, I would like to give you a very quick example. I have two brothers. They're both under the age of 40. They're in their early 30s. Each of them, by the way, uh, Icom, somebody's talking and you're, um, you're, uh, can you mute yourselves? So anyway, um, they're both under the age of, uh, of 34, actually. And both of them have developed uh, severe coronary artery disease, have received multiple stents. And when we tested their lipid profiles, uh, one of them had an HDL of eight milligram percent, and his brother had exactly double that number of 16. And I tried to test them because there are about three genetic, uh, um, you know, I Googled, three genetic uh, conditions which can cause this very low HDL familial. And I tried to test them genetically via Invitea and other uh, companies, which I do, I send samples for, United States. And guess what? It was very difficult. They will test the common genes, but they need, you know, and I even got a letter saying, so even after you test them and you diagnose the reason for their extremely low HDL, what are you going to do? Okay. And, and, you know, at this point in time, we have more answers than questions. So I would urge you to uh, be very careful about being too enthusiastic in genetic testing. Uh, because, you know, it, it might actually make you lose your focus. Let us focus on treating large numbers of people with blanket-like treatments. This is my opinion. Of course, my dream, like every one of you, is to have precision medicine. But this is my my my. Okay. Uh, if there is no other questions, I think I leave the uh, stage to Dr. Said Farag to present the last uh, session of this day. Uh, now I have a great honor to present, I think this will be the last presentation, but would not be the least because it will be presented uh, by Professor Atif al uh, he, will get, he will dive with us to, in the very important uh, bunch of trials, which is the Orion program, uh, and we have derived some lessons from the Orion program, which will be elegantly presented by Professor Atif al -Bahari. please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sayyid Farag, and uh, I welcome every uh, every friend uh, my all, all my colleagues uh, this lessons derived from orion uh, is made for the inclas run the uh, sirna targeting is uh, as we see which a new era and steroid reaching to the targets uh, adding at a high uh, or maximum tolerated statin doses and plus is it uh, we can get uh, more uh, target lowering of PCK9. And we can see here, this is delivered uh, to hepatocytes, the GNA seed and the ACPGR. And, uh, and after that, the guide is trying to deliver to the risk here, the RNA induced silencing complex, leading to risk uh, SRNA cleaves, PCK9, MRNA degraded. 
And at the end, it increased the LDL or dynasty decreasing the circulating LDL with a very simple and a very uh, complex uh, mechanism, but very brilliant and very genius. The clinical development program overview, as we see here, is starting by Novartis by 2016 and it will end by 2024. If you look here for the uh, phase two, two and phase one, as we see here, it, it is the uh, phase two and the phase is, it's three, starting from 2016 and ending in 2019. And then uh, the uh, phase three added the lowering Orion 9, 10, and 11, starting from 2017 and ending in the end of 2019. And then uh, the phase three cardiovascular outcomes, Orion 4, we are waiting for uh, at the end of 2024. If we look here for the Orion clinical development program with Inclistran, we go a dive here for Orion 1 and Orion 3. Orion 1, this is a clinical phase 2. The patient population are a serious chronic cardiovascular disease uh, or a serious cardiovascular disease with, uh, with other risk factors. The enrollment of a number of patients was 500. The follow-up time was, uh, was 180 days. The primary end point was LDL constitutional lowering. <clears throat> the Orion 3, our uh, clinical phase two extinction of Orion 1, comparison with Evolucumab, and uh, the number of patients was 490 patients. The follow up time was uh, 48 months, and the primary endpoint was LDL cholesterol lowering. The first lesson tried from Orion 1 and 3 is efficacy and safety. As we see here, th this is uh, phase two studies, Orion 1 study design. It's placebo controlled public client randomized. Those finding a study in 500 patients with a serious chronic cardiovascular disease or a serious chronic cardiovascular disease risk equivalents like type 2 diabetes, familial hypercholesterolemia, Framingham risk score or equivalent more than 20%. LDL cholesterol level was more than 70 or more than 100 milligrams per deciliter on background therapy. And as we see here, this is the screening and randomization, the one dose starting region and two dose starting regions. And we can see here the Orion 1 efficacy, show the efficacy with one dose starting regions, starting by reduction of <coughs> LDL cholesterol by 50.9% reduction, and the robust sustained LDL cholesterol lowering with one dose starting region here, as we see, again, it's a sustained reduction of LDL cholesterol. And with Orion 1 efficacy in two dose starting regions, as we see here, this is the uh, starting one, is reduction of 55.5% with, uh, with, with, with the starting uh, two doses, and continue with 52% uh, reduction of uh, LDL cholesterol, adjusted mean 50% reduction at nine months. And this is a robust sustained LDL cholesterol reduction optimal start vision. The Orion 1 show individual LDL cholesterol response at day 180 by two dose uh, starting region. As we see, the mean uh, lowering is 52.6% of, uh, of LDL cholesterol uh, lowering, and the maximum was 80.9% uh, if compared to placebo. Here, the long-term efficacy of 300 milligram in run the, or the extension of Orion 1 to Orion 3. This is a, a consistent lowering of LED cholesterol more than 50% with no loss of effect over three years. And this is the conclusion from the Orion 1 and 3. Uh, as we see, there is uh, uh, efficacy and safety. The highly consistent profile throughout Orion 1 and Orion 3 over about three years, injection site reaction frequent, mild, moderate, and the transient. And no liver function with this uh, increasing elevations considered related to run, no myalgia or CVK elevations considered related to run, no renal adverse events or thrombocytopenia considered related to run. <clears throat> and here we have a conclusion for long term safety of run. And uh, the run summary key points here 
for Orion 1 and 3. The resistant LDL cholesterol lowering primary endpoint at about 22 months from baseline showed 51% reduction in LDL cholesterol, and the p-value was highly significant. The time average lowering of LDL cholesterol in Orion 3 was about 60%. It was about 60 milligram per deciliter and well tolerated and no treatment related elevations of liver enzymes or changes in renal function. Then we come to phase three, Orion 9, Orion 10, Orion 11. Orion 9, as you see here, here this is the clinical phase number three. It, uh, the patient population was, were heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia and the number of patients was 482. And the follow-up time was 18 months, and the primary endpoint was lowering of LDL cholesterol. Orion 10 is a phase 3, and is a patient population with uh, a serious critical cardiovascular disease in the United States of America. And the enrollment was 1,561 patients, 18 months follow-up time, and the primary endpoint was LDL cholesterol lowering. Orion uh, 11, uh, clinical phase was 3. Those patients were uh, from, from the European Union, with having a serious chronic cardiovascular disease or a serious cardiovascular disease with, uh, with, uh, with risk equivalent. And the enrollment here was 1,617. The uh, follow-up time was 18 months and the primary endpoint was LDL cholesterol lowering. If you look for run, has moved it into phase three to, uh, to show the, the, the potency and the efficacy about for about 3,000 subjects with a serious critical cardiovascular disease or risk equivalent, Orion 10 and, uh, and 11, 400 uh, subjects with heterozygous similar hypercholesterolemia with Orion 9. What are the lessons derived from Orion 9, 10, and 11? We can see here the pivotal limit lower uh, studies here, as, as, as we see, it's a baseline for those patients where uh, more than uh, 60 milligrams per deciliter, and, and Orion 11 more than 70 and more than uh, 100 milligrams per, per, per deciliter. If you look for the design of the Orion 9, 10, and 11 studies, they have this, uh, including uh, all, all, all those patients, as I told you, and the age was more than 18 years, and they have high intensity statin on top. Of uh, already on top of high intensity statin. And they, uh, the randomization was 1.1, one, 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 and for 18 months duration, this is the run, and this is the high intensity statin uh, placebo arm. As we look here, the uh, primary endpoint was percentage change in LDL cholesterol from baseline to uh, today 510, and time adjusted percentage change in LDL cholesterol from baseline between day 90 and day 540. This is the average percentage change in LDL cholesterol from this line over the period between day 90 and day 540. The key secondary endpoints was absolute change in LDL cholesterol from this line to day 510, and time adjusted absolute change in LDL cholesterol from the baseline between day 90 and day 540. The percentage change from the baseline today, 510 and 9 level, and total cholesterol, ABOB, and non hdl cholesterol. These are the common study endpoints. End if you look for the strong consistent efficacy across the Orion 9, 10, and 11, demonstrating rapid potent and the durable LDL cholesterol flowing, as we see here, about 50% to 58% in the Orion 9, 10, Orion 11, respectively, and after the day is 92 to 540 average here, as we see, 45 or 56 and, and, and 50. The reduction of LDL cholesterol by day 510, as high as 58%, more than 50% in all populations, and reductions observed at days 90 and were broadly stable long term day 540 over closing period for six months met all the key secondary endpoints, LDL cholesterol change over time, the changes in the PCK9 and the other levels. If you look for Orion 9 specifically, it was here a rationale for genetic variation in heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. 
because Kirisakos familiar hyperconstrictinemia is characterized by elevated LED steroid from birth and a high risk of acetylcholinic cardiovascular disease. And due to mutations in the LD, LDLR, ApoB, and TCK9 genes, the overlap between severe HEFH genotypes and HOFH is greater than previously thought. Some subjects diagnosed clinically with HEFH may carry two mutations, like compound HEFH, different mutations in both alleles of one gene, or double HEFH mutations in one allele of two different genes. Therefore, the positive mutations are characterized by pathogenicity and by LDLR functional deficiency. And severity depends on residual LDLR function. Ankylis run here is, has been shown to robustly reduce LDL cholesterol in heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, and the treatment response with other limit lowering therapies has been shown to vary by uh, FH genotype. Therefore, it is important to confirm that treatment with Ankylis run is effective across the FH genotypes, as we see here with all the genotypes LDLR variants, two variants, ABOB non-identified, and the PCK9 gain of function. So LTSRAN and Orion 9 have an efficacy on changing the LDL cholesterol by any genetic variant from this uh, slide, as we see. After that, Orion 10 and 11 pooled analysis getting high-risk patients to or below recommended goals, as we see here, because the difference here was increased run was minus 53% reduction of LDL cholesterol by the day 510, and the difference in the primary endpoint was minus 56%, and the revalue were, were highly significant. These are the results for patients randomized to increase run in front of the placebo with high intensity statin, having less than 70% milligram of deciliter LDL cholesterol threshold, more than 90%, and who have for more than 50% LDL cholesterol lowering were 87%. The safety comparable to placebo in Orion 9 and 10 and 11 were are the same. There is uh, no adverse uh, events. And uh, very important, uh, we have to see here, the pre-specified excitatory cardiovascular endpoints by the media deposit uh, uh, show here, a, a reduction of MACE on this patient in cardiovascular death, in fatal or non-fatal MI and the stroke, as we see by 7.8%, 1.1%, 1.5%. No liver, no, no kidney, no muscle or predicted safety signals in Orion 9 or 10 or, or 11, or are here are very, very, very efficacy and safety of the Orion. And here we can see the Orion 9, uh, summary, Inkless run, lower LDL cholesterol, durability, and safety, uh, and safely in HFE, uh, in, e, uh, in EFH, and uh, well powered 18 months is uh, double blind randomized placebo controlled EFH trial. The Orion 9 met all primary and secondary efficacy endpoints 71% milligram per liter, 50% observed LDL cholesterol lowering at day five. Uh, 110, 63 milligram per deciliter, about 45% observed time adjusted LDL cholesterol lowering by, by day 90 to day 540. On top of statins, a high uh, uh, this statin, more than 90%, and is it a my, more than 50% of patients uh, uh, taking this medications. The robust reduction in LDL cholesterol with all underlying FH genotypes. And the safety profile of Inkelstrand was similar to placebo in a high risk population. Adverse events, incidents, and laboratory values not uh, uh, different. Only the injection site events were about 15% higher on Inkelstrand, but mostly mild and all it are uh, uh, transient. Inkelstrand shows potential to address the unmet, the unmet need for the high risk uh, EFH patients. Uh, uh, Orion uh, 10 summary, the Inkless run is a twice a year injection that lowered LDL cholesterol by about 50% safety, safely. The efficacy of Orion 10 met all primary and secondary endpoints. 
ankylostrand strand reduces the primary LDL cholesterol endpoint, and the safety and therapeutic as we see in strand safety profile was similar to placebo. No adverse changes in laboratory markers. Injection site events on the ankylostrand strand 2.6 percent predominantly mild and uh, non-persistent. The explanatory basket of cardiovascular events numerically less frequent on ankle strand than in placebo, which give us a, a courage to use uh, those medications. I, I, I will focus now on Orion 11, the potent, consistent, and durable LDL cholesterol lowering over 18 months, as we see. This is a change over time, as we see about 54%, and the highly significant LDL lowering versus placebo, as we see here, at the mean at days 510, and, uh, and there is 90 to 540, as we see a reduction by 44, 53, 50, and 50%. DP value were highly significant. The Orion 11, the safety and durability were all uh, here injection site adverse events were localized, mostly mild and, and, and the transient. And the safety for the liver, for the kidney, for, for the muscle. And hematology, all no evidence of liver, kidney, muscle, or platelet toxicity. The Orion take home message in Kilistrand two doses per year safely lowered LDL cholesterol by about 50%. Orion 11 met all primary and secondary endpoints. In Kilistrand reduced the primary LDL endpoint by 54% at 17 months, 50% time average. In Kilistrand resulted in potent. Consistent PCK9 knockdown and the safety therapy strength safety profile was similar to placebo. No adverse changes in laboratory markers. Injection site events 4.2% and the predominantly mild and non persistent. The expiratory in the point numerically fewer cardiovascular events were reported for ankle strand than placebo. When we come to the last one for Orion 4 outcome study, designed to confirm MACE and cardiovascular mortality benefit over five years. It will end in 2024. This is a parallel cardiovascular outcome trial in preparation for 15,000 subjects with high risk atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Eligibility here, age more than 55 years with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. They have a prior myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke or peripheral arterial disease, high-risk patients with LDL cholesterol values above 100 mg per deciliter, and, the, uh, and here the primary endpoint are composite mace, the power for more than 25% reduction in coronary heart disease deaths, MOI, fatal or non-fatal ischemic stroke, urgent coronary revascularization procedure, and secondary endpoint will be a composite of coronary heart disease deaths or MOI and cardiovascular deaths. The upside potential for larger cardiovascular mass risk reduction is possible. If we look here for the Orion 10 and 11 and the, uh, the, will, and, and, and the will coming Orion 4, we will find the computed five year mass with relative risk reduction here is about 37 or 33 percent, 31 percent in the Orion 10 and 11. And this uh, expected here to have a 30 percent reduction with Orion 4. So this is a paradigm shift in treating levels. Inkel strand is a twice a year sub, uh, subcutaneous injection that can be administered by all health care uh, physicians' office and potentially outside the pharmacy. Its durable efficacy allows opportunity to continue addressing the cardiovascular risk factors, treating other comorbidities, and bringing LDL cholesterol down further with uh, lipid lower a treatment to prevent and to treat. And the, here, as we see, the administration is renally excreted, no dose adjustment. The address is missed doses. If we take statins for 365 days a year, the PCK9 inhibitor are taking 26 days a year. The, the uh, Inkless run will be taken only two days a year. Uh, and, and this is, would be uh, magnificent if adding it to, it to highly uh, uh, intensity statin. For the fu future potential adherence improvement with the novel service, as we see from this good slide, we'll find that the adherence will be increased with using the ankylostrand by two injections 
and the uh, the time average for reduction of LDL cholesterol will be will be increased. We hope in the future we have vaccination for for occasional host and gene editing once in a lifetime. So if we look here for the adherence for patients with high potency statin and monoclonal antibody, comparing it with inking strand, we'll find the adherence is very high and the reduction and the time of reduction of the LD cholesterol will be very high. So the my take home message here, inking strand with summary about safety and efficacy. Efficacy favors inking strand, mean for protein convertase uh, subtilines, mixin type 9, a uh, percentage change from this line by about 80.9% a day, uh, 510. Mean LDL cholesterol change from this line by about 50.7% a day, 510. LDL cholesterol level decreased to uh, 55.1 milligram per deciliter a day, 500. The uh, bold data from Orion 9, 10, and 11 twice a year dosing, and the similar safety of placebo and the safety analysis, 3,655 patients with approximately 2,653 persons years of exposure to inkling strand, similar safety profile between inkling strand and placebo, modest excess of self-limited mild to moderate uh, <coughs> uh, 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 transient uh, adverse event at the injection site, and bronchitis, no difference between groups in liver, muscle, or hematological parameters. And I hope uh, I give a conclusion for all the Orion program. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Atif, for this uh, coverable presentation. And I think the future now uh, came to the stage uh, by new development of new drugs, by new technologies. And I think uh, Professor Sophie is raising a hand for the question. Yes. Please, Professor Sophie. Thank you, Atif, for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, lecture. Um, uh, for statins, we wait for uh, four weeks, four to six weeks, to show the results. They're reaching the number and 50, reaching uh, more than 55. And 55, the number LDL. And if you give yes. combination, the same. If you make PCS9, we have twice per month. So you have to measure and regarding Kriksaran, it's six months gap so when do you find your actual results because to be this is the target and this is a successful treatment yeah. in Kriksaran. Yeah. i'm not waiting for another six months so yes. you have to have a limit how can you manage this yes if, uh, for for the patients uh, in, including on the, as we see for the uh, high risk or very high risk patients if we are uh, giving ankle strand in, in the beginning with these patients from the, from the first day, I, I, I think with uh, on, on top of high and this statin plus is I think we will get to the goals of the guidelines uh, of 2019. And we, we, I think we will prevent the residual cardiovascular risk that can happen uh, during this period. Uh, so, uh, it, uh, the adherence is very important also on, on these patients. So uh, starting in strand on high intestinal statin plus isotomide can, within six months, uh, we can have the target uh, from the two uh, or three weeks. Uh, because as we see from the slides, uh, starting from the first months, we can see the, uh, the, uh, the reduction for 50% of LDL cholesterol in the arm of ankle strand plus the high intestinal statin, if compared to high intestinal statin. So, at the point, you mean Muhammad, that uh, one month, yani one month, yani, yani enter, you wait for one month, well, uh, two months, well, uh, like the no, statin, I will wait. I, 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 I can wait for one month. And this well, is well, logic. Yeah. This is well, logic. You have, you have answer? Well, 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 the protocol of giving ankle strand, بندي اول انجكشن وبعدين بندي الانجكشن الثانيه بعد ثلاث شهور بعد 3 ما افتر 3 مانس وبعدين بعد كده كل 6 شهور فاي ثينك كده يو هاف يعني يعني يو هاف شورتر تايم بيريود عن ال 6 شهور ان انت في اول ثلاث شهور تقدر تعرف توصلت لحد فين يس اوكي 
Uh, is there any question from the panel? Uh, anyway, I think uh, يعني, uh, it was a fruitful day. We thank you, Dr. Sobhi, being with us. The day of the day of the I enjoyed the, the, all the presentations and a lot of new information and new modalities for therapy. Thank you, Atif, Sayyid, Tamir, Hani, and all the faculty. وكل سنه طيبين و انت طيب يا اشرف اي وود لايك يا اشرف قبل ما نقفل اعمل نوتا بريك كده كان الدكتور هاني كان قال ان ان احنا بندي الانكلسران على 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 مودريت او مايلد او او لو دوز اوف ستاتنس بيفور ريتشنج ذا ماكسيمم توليريتد دوز اوف ستاتنس لا لا احنا المفروض ان احنا اون هاي انتست ستاتنس يعني الانكلسران الانكلسران هيتحط مع الهاي انتست ستاتنس لان ما فيش ريكومنديشن من نوفارتس حتى بكده يعني فارتس هاني هاني ونتس تو تو بوت ا ورنينج يو هاف تو ويت تيل ذا ماكسيمم توليتد دوز نوت راش تو جيف ذيس نيو موداليتيز لا لا لو انا هديه وبعد كده هديه بعد بعد يعني بعد هستنى ثلاث شهور يبقى من الاول ان شاء الله بس هو راش ليه ما انت انت لازم يو هاف تو ريتش عشان تو كونتينيو فور لايف يو هاف تو بروف to yourself and to the governments yes. and everybody yes. that this yes. is the only chance. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Cardio Alex, inshallah, with the benefit of Dr. Muhammad. With the benefit of Dr. Muhammad. We will give you all of us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.